Good evening, Impact DEV Church family, and good evening to all the friends of our ministry. I'm so glad that you made the decision to join us again tonight for our midweek Impact Bible study. I am so glad you're here. And so we're currently teaching on the grace of God. We're doing a comprehensive study on the grace of God, and we are several weeks in. And if you've missed anything, please go back and review. I believe it will be for your joy. And so before we pounce on our text for today, I'm going to ask you to go put your hands on your tools. Get your notepad, pen, paper, your iPad, your Android, your iPhone, whatever you utilize to capture good notes, whatever you feel comfortable with, go put your hands on that. Because I believe that God's going to speak to you this evening, and I want you to be able to capture the things that God will say to you, will say to you in the moment. Amen? And so I want to do a quick review of some of the things I've already talked about before I get into this evening's teaching on the appropriation of the grace of God. All of the Christian life is a matter of the grace of God. We are brought into God's eternal kingdom by the grace of God. We are positionally and practically sanctified by the grace of God. We are motivated to obedience by the grace of God. We receive strength and live the Christian life by the grace of God. We receive both temporal and spiritual blessings by the grace of God. The entire Christian life is lived by the grace of God. The first aspect of grace that I taught you could be defined as the free and unmerited favor shown to guilty sinners who deserve only judgment. And so to live by grace is to live solely by the merit of Jesus Christ and not based upon our own goodness or our own merit because we wouldn't have a leg to stand on. To live by grace is number one, to base my entire relationship with God, including my acceptance and standing on my union with Jesus Christ. Number two, it is to recognize that in myself, I bring nothing of value. I bring nothing of worth to my relationship with God. Because even my righteous acts are as filthy rags uh, in his sight. Isaiah tells us that in Isaiah 64 and 6. He says, we have all become like one who is unclean. And all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf and our iniquities like the wind take us away. All this means that my relationship with God is not based upon or conditioned upon my obedience or disobedience. My relationship with the sovereign God of the universe stands secure because of the perfect obedience of Jesus Christ. And so if you look at Ephesians, the first chapter and the sixth verse, it says this, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Now out of my gratitude to the praise of his glory and grace, now I seek to understand the scriptures and to obey the scriptures out of gratitude, not to be loved, but because I am loved. The second aspect of God's grace that we introduced last week, it could be defined as God's power that enables us to deal with life's circumstances. And that's how Paul uses the word grace in 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter and the 9th verse. It says this, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So Paul here uses that word grace to speak of God's power that enables us to deal with, to overcome life's circumstances. Last week, we talked about Philippians 4 and 13, where it says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. We could also, this verse could also be read as, I can do all things through and by the grace of God. And so last week I ended the teaching with challenging us to appropriate the grace of God. The Bible teaches that the believers must appropriate God's grace for our daily lives. We must appropriate it in order for us to live the life that brings glory to God, that brings us joy, and also puts us in a position to lead others into the joy of the Lord. 
2 Timothy, the second chapter, the first verse, reads like this. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And so the verb there, be strong, is in the imperative move. It expresses a command. We are being told to do something. Paul is telling Timothy to do something. And we are to respond in the same way that Paul was telling Timothy to respond. Paul wanted Timothy to appropriate the grace of God and to be strong in it. Appropriate it and be strong in the grace of God. So how is it that believers appropriate the grace of God? How do we appropriate God's enabling power? There's one word, and we've been talking about this one word through the book of James and through this teaching on the grace of God. That one word is humility. We appropriate the grace of God through humility. Pride opposes grace. Wherever there is pride, it opposes grace. God resists. He actively resists those who walk in pride, and he actively gives more grace to those who walk in humility. Look at 1 Peter 5 and 5. Again, we should be familiar with this by now. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now, I pray by now, over the last several months, through the book of James, and as we have gone through our teaching here on the subject of the grace of God, I pray that we understand now that God is saying something to us about walking in pride. I, that God is saying something to us about walking in pride. I believe that what the Holy Spirit is working out in us is a spirit of humility so that this impact DMV and and our lives in general can be instruments of the grace of God. So please get that and pray about that, that God helps us to walk in humility. Now, in order for us to walk in humility, that's a work of the Spirit. I think it was C.J. Mahaney who says that as we try to be humble, doing that, just trying to do that is pride itself. And so what we are challenged to do here, I believe that what James and what this teaching on grace is challenging us to do is to lean into God, recognizing that there's something in me that still wants to think that I am in control of my destiny and that all the good that has come to me, there's some kind of way I've worked that out myself and have not depended upon your grace or your mercy or you for the abundance of all things. So, you know, be challenged by that and lean into God and don't try to be humble. Just lean into God and say, God, do this in me, right? And so in this verse, we are given a verse, and that was just a little side note there. In this verse here, in 1 Peter 5 and 5, we're given a, a warning here. We're, we're given a, a warning about what happens when we walk in pride and what happens when we walk in humility. And to walk in pride is self-sufficiency towards God. In other words, God, I don't need you. God, I got this. God, I can do this without your help. But humility is the acknowledgement of weakness. And that's why I uh, said a few minutes ago, don't try to walk in humility. Acknowledge that you're weak. Acknowledge that, God, I need you in this area. I don't need help to walk in pride, but I absolutely need help to walk in humility. It is the acknowledgement, God, that I am unworthy and I am inadequate to fulfill your purposes in the world. And so when we are humble, God promises us that he will give us more grace. Now, this is not an isolated theme. We see this all through scripture, that God brings the proud down and God elevates those who walk in humility. Humility. Jesus teaches this in Matthew, the 23rd chapter, in the 12th verse. It says, whoever exalts himself will be humble, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. It is one principle that has two sides. It's one principle that has two sides. It's a promise that if we exalt ourselves, that God would humble us, and if we humble ourselves, 
we will be exalted by God. We also see this principle in Luke the 14th chapter. For everyone who exalts himself will be humble and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So what we've seen so far is that Peter, Jesus, James, Luke, as well as the Apostle Paul, they're teaching us this spiritual law, this consistent spiritual law. And the spiritual law is this, that exaltation follows walking in humility. Exaltation follows humility. So if you want to do great things for God, you got to walk in humility. Why? Because when you walk in humility, when people praise you, you don't terminate that praise on yourself. You truly in, in all sincerity, you say to God be all the glory. The, 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 the accolades are not terminated on yourself, right? Because you know you didn't do it. You know that if it had not been for the grace of God, the enablement of God, the favor of God, you would not have been able to accomplish the things that you have accomplished. So exaltation follows walking in humility. That's a spiritual law, just like the law of gravity, just like the law of air dynamics listen put that law to the test all right and again don't try to walk in humility in your own strength the whole point is to acknowledge to say to God God I need the fruit of your spirit in my life I need you to do a work on my heart I'm dependent upon you Lord to walk or work humility out in me and we'll talk more about that as we go on so we also see this spiritual law illustrated in the book of Daniel. Go there if you would. We're here uh, to talk about Nebuchadnezzar uh, here in the fourth chapter of the book of Daniel and how he exalted himself, but God humbled him. Look at Daniel 4, 29 through 33. At the end of the 12 months, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. And the king answered and said, Is not this great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? While the words were still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven. O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you, and you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. And you shall be made to eat grass like an ox. And seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he wills. Immediately the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from among men and ate grass like an ox. And his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair grew as long as eagle's feathers and his nails were like bird's claws. So Nebuchadnezzar in this text, he exalted himself, but God humbled him. He wandered around eating grass like an ox, but God humbled him. And once that humility came, guess what? God exalted him. Look at the 37th verse. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven for all his works are right and his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Now let's look at Joseph as an example as well. Now this is the positive side. We just looked at Nebuchadnezzar, which was a negative side where he exalted himself and God humbled him. Let's look at Joseph where we're gonna see he humbled himself and God exalted him. Look at Psalms 105 and we're gonna read verse uh, 17 through 21. It reads, he had sent a man ahead of them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. His feet were hurt with fetters. His neck was put in a collar of iron until what he had said came to pass. The word of the Lord tested him. The king sent and released him. The ruler of the people set him free. 21, he made him Lord of his house and ruler of all his possessions. Joseph walked in humility. Uh, he had challenges in his life, but he trusted God. He walked in humility. And at the right time, God exalted him and he exceeded the status of all his possessions. 
brothers. So the question is, do you understand humility? Do we understand humility? Do we actually know what it means? And I'm challenged to believe that sometimes people don't know what it means. Sometimes people think that humility is walking around with your head down, afraid to look at people. That's not walking in humility. That's more shame than anything. And God has rescued us from our shame. And so biblically, humility is dependence upon God. So when you hear me talking about walking in humility, I'm not talking about walking around with your head down, shoulders slumped. That's not humility at all. God doesn't want us walking around like that, but God does want us walking around in complete dependence upon him and submission to him in everything for what he is, what he has done, what he's going to do in the future, walking in dependence and submitted to his purposes in the universe. So how do we humble ourselves and how do we appropriate this grace that I have been talking about for the last several weeks? Well, number one is, it's the idea of acknowledging weakness. It's the idea of acknowledging weakness. Number two, it is taking possession of divine strength that is made available to us through Jesus Christ. Okay. All right, so first it is acknowledging weakness. Secondly, it is taking possession of divine strength that we have received through the atoning work of Jesus Christ. So God uses means to bring his grace to us. God's grace doesn't always just drop out the sky. If we are to grow in his grace, be strengthened in his grace, appropriate his grace, there are means that God lays out for us in scriptures by which we grow and appropriate, take hold of, walk in the grace of God. Let's look at the first one, Bible study. The first means of appropriating God's grace, Bible study. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you think that Bible study is important? Now, if you ask me that question, I would scream yes, and that's why I'm here every Wednesday. That's why I study the Word of God to bring a presentation to you weekly because I want you to know what the Word of God actually says because you don't know what's in your package. You don't know what came along with your salvation if you don't study the Word of God. And so many times Christians live way beneath their privileges because they don't know what the Word of God has said about them. They live in fear. They live in condemnation. They live in shame. They live in, 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 in lack. All right? They live in discouragement. They live in hopelessness because they don't know what the Word of God says. But if we're going to be uh, appropriate the grace of God, if we're going to walk in God's enablement, we know we need to know what God has promised us. We have to know those truths. We have to know that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. We need to know that he who's begun a good work in us, he is faithful to complete it. We need to know that nothing will ever be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We need to know that that's in the text because when the wicked one attacks us, where do we draw from if we have not read it? The Holy Spirit promises that he would bring back to our remembrance, all right? If there's nothing for him to regather right, in our minds to, to, to remind us of, what are we going to do in those challenging seasons? There has to be there something there. So I believe that studying the word of God is extremely important for the believer. Look at Acts, the 20th chapter, the 32nd verse. Acts 20, 32. It says, and now I commend you to God. Now catch this. And to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Now this here is a reference to uh, on the ongoing usage of the scriptures. All right, this is a reference to us being students of the word of God. So I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. Why? Because it's the word of God that builds the Christian in the faith. It's the word of God that builds the Christian in the faith. And he calls it the word of his grace, his empowerment. All right. Are you tracking with me there? The word of his empowerment. What does this word do? Number one, it is able to build you up. 
It's able to build you up. Number two, it gives you an inheritance among those who are called the sanctified. Right? It gives us an inheritance. So the Bible is the only source of truth we have about God. Right? The Bible is the only source of truth that we have about God. Look at 2 Timothy, the third chapter and the 16th verse. 2 Timothy 3 and 16. It says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So what Paul is saying to Timothy here in this text is that the Bible comes from God. He is the ultimate author of the scriptures that we read. The Bible provides information about God that we cannot find anywhere else. The Bible is a divine self-disclosure. God is unfolding himself to us in the scriptures. We see the mind of God. We learn how God thinks. We learn what brings him pleasure, what, uh, what, what angers him, what frustrates him, what brings him joy. We read all of that in the word of God. So God reveals himself through his word. So the Bible is more than a book of objective truth. The Bible is actually life-giving as well. If we look at John 6 and 63, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. So God works in our lives through his word. God works in our lives through his word. And if we're, again, if we're not studying the word of God, if we're not reading the word of God, then we're missing out on a work of God. Now, this is not about salvation, but it absolutely is about living the victorious life. It's not about our justification, but it is about us walking in victory. Look at 1 Thessalonians 2, 13. It says, and we also thank God constantly for this, that when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. All right, so the, the writer here is saying, listen, the word that you heard us preach and teach, you accepted it. Yes, you accepted it. But you realize that these aren't our words, but these are actually the words of God. And the word of God is what's able to transform us. It's able to give us strength and hope. It gives us the power to accomplish all that God has for us to accomplish and to walk in here while we're here on the earth. So how do we learn the importance of walking in humility and the fact that we need to destroy the pride in our lives by the grace of God? How do we learn that? Where do we learn that? How do we learn that we need the grace of God right, to survive, to live, to honor him? How do we learn that? We learn that by studying the word of God. God uses the scriptures to mediate his grace. He uses the scriptures to transfer or to dig down deep within us the fact that we have the power of God and it has been granted to us by the atoning work of Jesus Christ. And we did not deserve it. It is a grace gift. And we only learn that by studying the word of God. R.C.H. Linsky said this, God and the word of his grace always go together. God lets his grace flow out through his word. So there is a close connection between God and his word. Let me say this again. There's a close connection between God and his word. We see this in Romans, the 15th chapter. Go there if you would. Romans 15, verse 4 through 5. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Jesus Christ. So what verse 4 tells us is that we receive patience and comfort from the scriptures. But if you look at verse 5, it says that God gives patience and consolation. So patience and consolations are provisions 
from God by his grace to help us in the time of need. So the way that God typically supplies patience and consolations is through his word. And so if we are to appropriate the grace of God, if we are to walk in the power and the authority and the, uh, the joy of the scriptures, we must regularly expose ourselves to the word of God. And if we're not doing that, listen, it, it, we're going to be challenged to walk in God's joy on a regular basis because we're not going to have anything to draw from. So a regular intake of God's word is necessary to sustain a healthy spiritual Christian life. So how does spending time with God equate to walking in humility? Well, the humble person, he depends on God. And since he depends on God, he's going to be regularly in the scriptures because he wants to know the mind of God. And so a person who walks in humility is going to be in constant pursuit of the mind of God. But the proud person, he's not going to spend time in the word of God because he doesn't think he needs it. He doesn't think he needs to learn anything. He considers himself, though he may not say it out of his mouth or her mouth, they consider themselves uh, to be independent from God. So I think that a lack of spending time in the word of God is a manifestation of pride. Yeah. Yeah, I know that may get me in trouble, but I'm saying it anyway. I think a lack of spending time, a lack of having a dedicated set time where you're studying the word of God, where you're engaged in Bible study, not just having it on and walking all around, but you're engaged in Bible study. A lack of doing that is a clear indication that you're walking in pride. And if you're walking in pride, then God is actively resisting you, right? He's actively resisting you. So you're wondering, why am I having the struggles that I'm having? Because you're walking in pride. And because you're walking in pride, God has resisted you. But if you humble yourself and become a student of the word of God, then God gives you more grace. Why? Because you're saying to God, I need your grace. God, I need you. Look at Jeremiah, Jeremiah 13 and 15. He says, hear and give ear. Be not proud, for the Lord has spoken. Look at Psalms 119 and 21. You rebuke the insolent, accursed ones who wander from your commandments. Look at Psalms 119 to 50, first verse this time. He says, the insolent utterly deride me, but I do not turn away from your law. There's something that happens when we are students of the word of God. There's a joy, there's a confidence, there's a strength, there's a boldness, there's a power that we walk in. And God designed it as such because that's one of the means by which we appropriate his grace. So through his word, we are strengthened, we are encouraged, and through his word, we are comforted. The second means of receiving God's grace or appropriating God's grace or walking in the power of God's grace is through prayer. Um, look at Hebrews, the fourth chapter, the 15th and the 16th verse. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16. It says, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who is in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. This verse is a call to prayer. It's a, it's a cry out for God's enablement, God's power. We, we receive that or it is appropriated to us when we kneel in prayer. When we kneel down to prayer, remember the second aspect of the word grace, we receive the power to deal with life's circumstances. We see the disciples went before the throne of God when they were commanded by the Jewish rulers not to preach nor speak about Jesus Christ. Look, look at Acts, the fourth chapter and the 29th verse. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word 
with all boldness. So we see that the apostles immediately went to God in prayer. They went to God in prayer because they knew they needed God's enablement. They knew they needed the power of God to be able to speak boldly about Jesus Christ, though they had been told not to by the rulers. They needed power, God's power. They needed his authority. They needed God's wisdom. They needed God to open up the door so they could do what needed to be done. They knew that all of that was way beyond their capability. So in all humility, they lean into God and they began to pray. Now remember that grace is God's power that enables us to deal with life's circumstances. And so they went to God in the complete acknowledgement that God, this is something that I cannot handle myself. So they went to God in what? They went to God in prayer for the appropriation of his grace. And so prayer actually is the declaration of dependence. It's the declaration of dependence, not independence, but the declaration of dependence. What you're saying to God when you pray is that God, I need you. God, I need you. And, and where there is prayerlessness, then what you're saying to God is, God, I don't need you. It's just that simple. And so prayer should be an active part of our daily lives. We go to God and we ask for forgiveness in prayer because we know that God, the sovereign God of the universe, is the only one that can forgive sin. We thank him because we know that everything that we have has been given to us by God, for God, to push back what is dark in the world. So we go to him in prayer and we thank him because we know that that task is exclusively his. And we petition God in our time of need because we know that he is the only one that can meet our needs. Abraham Lincoln said this, he says, I have been driven many times to my knees by the overwhelming conviction that I had nowhere else to go. My own wisdom and that of all about me seem insufficient for the day. And so prayer is an act of humiliation. The proud don't need God, so the proud don't pray. Look at 2 Chronicles 7.14. It says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. When we humble ourselves in prayer, God will heal our land. The third means of appropriating grace in our lives is submission. God uses our submission to his providential working in our lives as a means for grace. Go back to 1 Peter 5, 5 and 6. It says, likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another, for God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. So God gives more grace to those who humble themselves under his mighty hand. Another way to say that is that God gives more grace to those who submit to his providence, to those who submit to his providence. Our natural tendency, though, is not to submit to God's providence. We try our best to get out of every situation that we are challenged with in life instead of going through like a good soldier, leaning into trusting God because many of the struggles that we are dealing with we are having these challenges because God is maturing us. God is developing in us tried character. And so instead of trying to jump out of anything too quickly, we need to lean into and trust God's providence and pray that God gives us the grace to endure this. They used to sing a song when I was a kid, Lord, don't move my mountain, but God give me the strength to climb. And that's Another means of appropriating the grace of God is to endure like a good soldier leaning into God and saying to God that I need your power. So if we're going to appropriate God's grace, we must submit to his providential working in our lives. We must submit to the mighty hand of God. And to do that, we must do at least three things. One, we must see his mighty hand behind all the immediate causes of our adversities and heartache. Number two, we must believe the biblical teaching that God is in 
sovereign control over all of our circumstances. And number three, we can only know these things if we spend time in the word of God. We see both Job and Joseph being uh, examples for the principles I just shared with you. Let's look at Job's response to a tragedy. Job 121. He says, and he said, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked shall I return. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Look at Job 2 and 10. But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God and shall we not receive evil? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. And so Job ascribed his immediate troubles. He ascribed all that he was dealing with to the hand of God. And we see Joseph, he's going to do the same thing. Look at Genesis 45 and 8. Genesis 45 and 8. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. So we see from this text that Job as well as Joseph saw the sovereignty of God as ruling over all the challenges and all the circumstances that they endured. And so when our circumstances are difficult, when they're disappointing, when they're humiliating, we have to humble ourselves under the providential working of the sovereign God of the universe and still believe that God you love me and that all things are working together for my good just as it says in Romans 8 28 let's read it and we know that for those who love God all things are working together for good for those who are called according to his purpose and so we have to pray for the grace of God pray for the will of God the power of God to help us to accept God's providential working in our lives in those difficult seasons and is that not what the grace of God is based upon what we talked about last week? The grace of God being God's enablement, God's power to help us deal with life's circumstances. So if we're going to walk in the grace of God, if we're going to appropriate the grace of God, we must accept what God allows. But while we're in the middle of it, we're still leaning into God and we're trusting God that some kind of way, Father, this is going to result in you being glorified and it's going to result in me walking in joy. God's going to give us the strength to deal with what we need to deal with in life, but it requires humility. Humility is the key to all of the means that I've addressed thus far. Why? Because it is the humble person who's going to spend time in God's word. It's the humble person who's going to spend time in prayer. And number three, it's the humble person who will submit to God's sovereign will that will submit to God's providence and experience great grace to endure. Look at James 4 and 6, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Now, I told you that if I had time, I would add one more means to us receiving the grace of God. Look at Ephesians 4 and 29. I think I have time. If I don't, then uh, just bear with me for a couple of minutes. Ephesians 4, 29. It says, let no corrupt talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. Another means for us receiving the grace of God is through other believers. Another tool that God utilizes to strengthen us and to give us enablement for the journey is other believers. I've been in the pit of despair before and God would use a friend. He would send sometimes a friend I have not even spoken to in a long period of time. He would use them to come and to speak life to me, speak strength to me, speak encouragement to me. I can't tell you how many times I was struggling and I would get a phone call or a knock on the door or an email or a text message from someone who knew nothing about what I was dealing with and they speak life to me. So God would use other people. And how this works is that they would speak to me and remind me about what I know about the scriptures. 
what I know about the character and the nature of the sovereign God of the universe. And that's why it's good to have good covenant relationships with our brothers and sisters because God would absolutely use them to bring strength to you. Look at Ecclesiastes, the fourth chapter, verse nine and 10. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one would lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. And here again, the proud don't benefit from the grace of God because they don't think they need people. They don't think they need anybody. They think they can do it all by themselves or have done it all by themselves. And so another means of grace is withheld from them. And that's why the Bible again says God resists the proud but gives more grace to those who are humble. During the time when David was hiding from Saul, he, was, he fled to the cave of Adullam. We see Psalms 142 and 4. Look to the right and see. There is none who takes notice of me. No refuse remains to me. No one cares for my soul. This verse is very sad to me for David to say that no one cares for my soul. But I, I get it because this is what happens to the individual who walks in pride. They, 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 they feel as though they're self-sufficient and they don't need anybody. And if you walk around acting like you don't need anybody, guess what? People are going to leave you alone. They're going to leave you to your own devices. But the humble person, the humble person realizes that I can't do this by myself, that I need somebody. Not only am I going to be dependent upon God, but I'm also going to be dependent upon my brothers and sisters. I'm going to lean into them at times. I'm not going to wear them down, but I will lean into them because I want them to know that I need you. Not only do I need you, but guess what? You need me. So just like I need you to be there for me, I am going to be there for you. Believers, we need one another. And that is one of the mechanisms, the means of grace that God utilizes to get more strength, to get more power to you and I, to help us to endure life's circumstances. So grace is available for every single believer in the time of need. God's grace is sufficient. God's grace is available to help us to endure life's circumstances. But catch this, we must appropriate it. We must appropriate it. And the way we appropriate it is to walk in humility. And the, the, the manifestation of walking in humility is when we study God's word, number two, when we pray, number three, when we submit to his providential working, and number four, when we allow other people to minister to us and we minister to them. Can you bow your heads? Father, I thank you for this opportunity that you've given me once again to talk to our covenant body about the administration, the appropriation of your grace. Father, I pray that you have done something in all of us today that opens us up to more grace, Father God, opens us up to more of your power, Father God. And what I'm praying you do, Father God, is destroy pride in us, Father. Make us humble, Lord. That can only happen as a, 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 by your spirit. So, so, Father, we lean into your spirit now and we pray for humility. We pray that over this house, Lord, there would be a spirit of humility, Father God. Do this in this house, Lord, so this can can be a culture of, of, of grace, Father God, a culture of strength, Father God, not just to me, but to all of us who are called by your name, Father. So make us students of the word. Lord, I pray that you'll cause us to fall on our knees. Father, I pray that we will submit to your providential dealings, Father. And I pray, Father God, we will allow, we won't be too proud, Father, to allow others to minister to us, Father. And Lord, I thank you for your grace. We're going to appropriate it by your grace and by your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. God bless you, and we'll see you next week.